Louise, a river runs through it. Legends of the Fall, California, True Romance, Seven, Twelve Monkeys, Fight Club, Snatch, Oceans 11, 12, and 13, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Babel, The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford, Burn After Reading, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, Inglorious Bastards, The Tree of Life, and Moneyball. Add to that the Academy Award and Golden Globe nominations, the Golden Globe, National Society of Film Critics, New York Film Critics, and Venice Film Festival Awards won. And consider the fact that People Magazine has named tonight's guest one of the 50 most beautiful people in the world twice, and the sexiest man alive twice. Empire Magazine has listed him as one of the greatest movie stars of all time, and Time Magazine has listed him and Angelina Jolie in their annual 100 Most Influential People in the World issue for their philanthropic work. Those are a few of the Hill House, now Jane Pitt. What are their ethnic backgrounds? We're probably products of Irish, Scots, Germans who settled in the area. Uh, Native American Indian. I know we have some Seminole and some Cherokee Indian in us. Where did you grow up? Springfield, Missouri. How many siblings do you have? I have a younger brother, Doug, and a younger sister, Julie. What was your father's profession? My father worked his way up through a trucking company and ended up managing it in his later years. What was life in Springfield like? It's Mark Twain country. It's Jesse James country. A lot of hills, a lot of lakes. I got my first BB gun preschool. I got my first 12 gauge in kindergarten or first grade. <laughs> I was shooting shit up a year later. Really? Yeah. What were your interests as a kid? Uh, sports girls, shooting things. In that order? Not quite. <laughs> what about movies? Were they an important part of your movies life? Movies were a big important, important part of the life. Was Planet of the Apes? Planet of the Apes was a big one for me, yeah. I would go, we have this, the, we also, we, the, we had the ape -a every summer, and they would play all five movies straight. And my mom, maybe she just wanted a day off, but she would drop me off in the morning and <laughs> pick me up at nine that night. Saturday Night Fever? Saturday Night Fever is a big one for me because it was the first R-rated movie that I snuck into. And it's still one of my all-time favorites. Um, but not just because... I'm a profound dancer. <laughs> it's be, it, was, it was seeing another culture that was so much different than, than mine. It was seeing the, the way they, they were, would talk to each other at the table and, and get in these arguments. And, and uh, uh, you know, he messes my hair. I, I work very hard on my hair, and he messes my hair, and this kind of stuff. And I, I just... Uh, and the language, and, and it was another culture for me. It was a foreign land to me. What were your academic interests in high school? I really liked math. I liked math, math and science the most. How did you do academically? I did just well enough. Just well enough? <laughs> yeah. What college did you attend? University of Missouri, Mizzou. They had a really good J school, journalism school, and, uh, and it, I had visited all the campuses and some road trips, and I think that's the one I had the most fun at. I, when and why did you leave college? It was two weeks before graduation, and I realized I saw all my friends who were signed up for jobs, and I realized I hadn't. And I'd always lamented that acting was not the career choice where I grew up. And it finally occurred to me that I could just load up my car and go to it. And so I'm still like a couple of credits short of graduating. Who is Runaround Sue? That was my beat up piece of shit Dotson that I drove out. How much money did you have in your pocket when you arrived? I left with 325. I probably landed with about 225 and 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 uh, I stopped at a McDonald's and I saw this newspaper when I got to Burbank. I was staying in Burbank. And uh, it said extra work. You could be an extra. And you had to pay $25 and they take your picture and they send you out. Did you get some extra work? Yeah, by that Friday. Since 1994, we've heard some vivid accounts of the aptly named odd jobs that young actors and some of our students do. Did you have some as you began life in L.A.? I had a lot of them. I mean, it's what you do, right? 
That's what you what do. did you do, for example? The famous one that I had to dress up like a chicken for El Polo Loco and, <laughs> and say, you know, burritos, 99 cents. And then I, uh, and I drove strippers, which was an interesting... Uh... Now, now, this is the Actors Studio Drama School at Pace University. We're very interested here in... Uh, strippers? Uh, in... <laughs> in the craft of our guests. Obviously, you've struck a nerve. What do you mean you drove strippers? You would have to go to the, the girl's apartment, pick her up, and then you would have to drive her to the party. You would then re be responsible for playing the music, which was cassette then, and then you had to ch catch the clothes so the guys didn't steal them as they came off, and then you had to try to collect the money at the end and get out of there alive, and it, it was not always easy. Did you enjoy that work? Yes, I did. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you something. I found my acting coach from it, too. See, I knew where I was going. These are students, after all. This is what we want to know. How did you find your acting coach through the strippers? There was a new girl there, and she told me about this class she started taking. It turned out to be Roy London, who was a beautiful human being and Roy London was, a, was a was a major force in Los Angeles yeah. we've talked about him with Sharon Stone mm -hmm. and with Gina Davis yep that's right what did you get from him it was the first entry into craft into making it your own into in, investing in your own experiences and seeing what you can bring to the table and it just it was that first thing that started pointing me in the direction I wanted to go in my opinion not since Tom Cruise skidded into view in his underwear, framed in a doorway in risky business, has there been as auspicious a film entrance as this one in which J.D. describes his larcenous skills in Thelma and Louise. <laughs> How did that role come to you? With difficulty, it was actually cast two times before. It came up a third time, and it was a week before they were starting to shoot, and they were desperate. <laughs> and uh, I, I stuck my way in. You have only a few scenes in the film. One of them was a steamy love scene. Was it easy for you? <laughs> You're it's laughing. Was it funny? I've stayed away from them since. It's really... Um, Discombobulating. Uh, How so? Uh, well, <laughs> well, I was uh, young and virile. <laughs> and Gina's Gina. On three occasions, we've talked about a fascinating movie called Seven. What drew you to this project? I read the first three pages of the script and I went, and I tossed it. And it was about an old cop who wants out and a new cop wants in. And, and I, I just said, I've seen this story. And a dear friend of mine who's sitting right over here, Cynthia, who I've worked with for so many years, said, no, just read it. Just read it, read it, read it. And, uh, and I did. And, uh, <laughs> um, and I said, so I met with Fincher, and, and it was really f sitting down with, with uh, my now dear friend, David Fincher. Uh, and I remember this moment, we just were talking the same language, the same love of films, the same um, irritations with film, and just speaking the same language. Tell us about working with Morgan Freeman. He's got this amazing ability to actually take a power nap between takes. <laughs> They're adjusting the light, and he'll go... Morgan, put the gun down, David. <laughs> and it's flawless. Flawless. What did you see in Detective David Mills that made you want to play him? There's a, you know, a, an American hubris to thinking you have the world figured out. That character saw the world in black and white and good and bad, and he pays in a big way for that hubris. Seven refers to the seven deadly sins. And we see them one after another, graphically and relentlessly. 
The last two, Envy and Wrath, are saved for the finale of the film. Brad received an Academy Award Supporting Actor nomination and won a Golden Globe Award for his portrayal of Jeffrey Goins in 12 Monkeys. This will explain why. What drew you to that role? I thought it was very important and more interesting to, to stretch it, see, see how far you can go in, in other directions. Did you do any research? We did do some research at, at, wow. uh, at Bellevue here. And then there was a problem because they were calling their parents and saying Brad Pitt came up <laughs> to the hospital. And, and they were calling the doctor saying, oh, no, it's getting really bad again, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, true, true. When George Clooney was here recently, we talked about Ocean's Eleven. He said it was one of the easiest shoots of his career. Did you feel the same way? Yes, I did. One of the reasons George felt that way was the director, Steven Soderbergh. Tell us about working with Soderbergh on Ocean's Eleven. He's just no-nonsense, knows exactly what he wants. He just all put us in a room together the first day and let us sniff each other out, and everyone became instant friends, and that thing he let roll. George Clooney mentioned you fondly when he was in that chair. He also said this. I have done some horrible things to people. <laughs> truly, truly horrible. I'm working on one right now for Brad Pitt that might end his career. <laughs> I owe him, so I'm getting it. I'm working on it. It's, I've been working on it for two years. <laughs> yeah, I just let him sit. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but just know I got it. <laughs> Since your career is flourishing, I gather that George's I... plot has not come to fruition yet. Hmm? Can I tell you why he owes me? What is the idea? We were about to film in Italy, and George is, George is our ambassador on the set. And uh, I sent a memo to the entire crew in Italian that said, Dear crew. <laughs> oh, I see this one coming up the highway. Um, we wish you a wonderful shoot. George Clooney asks that um, this is a very difficult role for him. He needs to concentrate deeply. To Mr. Clooney asked that uh, you try not to interrupt him. Uh, look him in the eye. If you do need to address Mr. Clooney, please refer to him only as Daniel or Mr. Ocean. <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience. We're all after the same thing. Let's make the best movie we can. <laughs> Went on for two weeks. <laughs> No. He handled it gracefully, gracefully but uh, he, was, he was becoming unnerved, I think. <laughs> I knew that something bad was going to happen by me doing this, so I came up with a second one. <laughs> and I thought about a preemptive strike, but it was so ugly. Whatever he's got, this is uglier. <laughs> it's so bad. It's so bad. It's so bad, I don't even know if I can do it. It's so bad. <laughs> What drew you to one of the title roles in Mr. and Mrs. Smith? I just found it really funny uh, that a couple, I mean, relationships are difficult as they are, but that they actually wanted to kill each other. I just found it really damn funny. Against your will or your wishes, the two of you became at that moment, the center of the tabloid universe. Yay! <laughs> you better have a sense of humor about it, right? This is what the eager world saw on the screen. Are you <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
we heard her account of acting with you in this film. Tell us about acting with her under these circumstances and in this film. Well, this film required a lot of invention along the way. And when, when you are in that situation, you want a fellow actor that um, um, is throwing out a lot of ideas and quick and decisive about it. And, th and that's her. I think that's why she's gone on to write and direct. She's, she's really gifted in that way. For me, one of the most interesting aspects of tonight's journey is the way in which you and Angelina have rendered the gossip irrelevant by using the attention and influence that fame brings in tireless and often selfless humanitarian and philanthropic work. That's what you turned this story into. How much money has the Jolie Pitt Foundation donated to charities approximately, would you say? I have no idea. I mean, uh, certainly tens of millions, yes. How have you and Angelina responded to the Katrina catastrophe in New Orleans? We've started with the recovery effort and bringing families home. We took an area that had the least chance of coming back and we started building there and building homes that treated families with dignity that neighborhood is starting to thrive again haven't you also the two of you you moved into new orleans yeah we have a base there yeah angelina's deep personal devotion to children was evident children in general and children specifically when she was with us how many adopted and biological children do you and she have six you seem to be taking a great deal of pleasure from parenthood it's been the greatest adventure i've been on yet in 2007 brad was honored as best actor at the venice film festival for his performance in the assassination of jesse james by the coward robert ford <laughs> what kind of research did you do on the period and on jesse james I certainly read everything I, I could. Um, as we've established tonight, I was quite comfortable with guns, so that wasn't an issue. How did what you learned about Jesse James and the experience of bringing him to life affect your view of him, of James, and the way you played him? I just found a, a man who was tormented by his, I guess, his, his outcome. I don't know how much he wrestled with guilt. It was more about being caught in a trap, not knowing how to, how to get out of it or get above it. Here is Brad Pitt's Jesse James. 2008 saw the arrival of a curious and fascinating movie called The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. It would receive 13 Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Actor for Brad. You must have had a crystal ball when you chose this one. What prompted you to undertake the role of a man who ages backwards from dotage to infancy? Um, I've been familiar with this thing for 12 years. It had been floating around. I just wasn't going to miss out on it. We were going to spend time in New Orleans, which I, of course, have a love for. Uh, it was just a great experience. With this film, a subject we seldom have reason to explore on our stage comes up, and that, of course, is makeup. What did the old age makeup involve, and how long did it take to apply it? It started out six hours, and then they got it down to five. I mean, counting the wig and everything. I'm sure it wasn't shot in sequence, so I would dare say that from day to day you would have to age or be young. Or... Yeah, there was, a, of course, some bouncing around due to locations and things. I'm open to that. I like the roll of the dice. What are, you know, what's the hand we're going to get as far as sequencing of when you shoot things? I find that exhilarating as well. That brings us to a daring film that won the Cannes Film Festival Palme d'Or. And an Oscar nomination, it's called The Tree of Life. <laughs> what drew you to this movie? Terry and I had been... Terry, Terry being? Terry Malick. It was a thing that he was working on when he took his hiatus, you know, some 28 years ago. And it's gone through many incarnations, and, and he said he was ready to do it, and asked us to produce it. And I said, you know, of course, absolutely. This is only his fifth film since Badlands in 1973. Tell us about working with him on the set. Well, Terry's a lovely, lovely man. He just, he's so wonderful to talk to. He, um, 
That's good, Brad. That's that's good. He's the guy standing there with the butterfly net, and he's waiting till something comes by, happens, and he grabs it when it happens. This role was a decided departure for you, both externally and internally. Here is the character who is known only by his last name, Mr. O'Brien. How much of that was improvised? That whole scene was ad-libbed. Um, that was, you know, a father who, who was wrestling with a world that, that he felt was more powerful than himself and wanting to prepare his kids for the idea that, for, that they would face the same kind of hardships and he was doing it the best way uh, he knew how to do it. I find it a very upsetting scene, actually. In the past year, you've had the good sense and taste to appear in two Oscar-nominated films. It's time for us to talk with great pleasure about Moneyball. You're credited as a producer. Like the Tree of Life, this film was several years in development, was it not? Yeah, it was five, I think. Why? If you're familiar with the book, it's got economics and sabermetrics and science at the forefront. It took a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of people to, to, to figure out what it was, what it was going to be. Whom do you play? Billy Bean. And Billy Bean is who? Billy Bean is the GM of the Oakland A's. We focus on his period during 2002. One of the most impressive elements of the movie is the apparent authenticity of the inside baseball negotiations like these. Did you spend time with Billy Bean? Did spend a lot of time with Billy. I just didn't want to do him wrong. I really liked the guy immediately and met his family and there's a responsibility to, of course, to, to do him justice. Who directed this movie? Mr. Bennett Miller. Is Mr. Bennett Miller in the house? Mr. Bennett Miller is in the house. Would you introduce him, please? Tell us about working with Brad on this film, please. From our very first meeting, we discussed the Trojan horse approach to making a film in the Hollywood system. I think we both felt like this film provided an opportunity to uh, explore issues and look at something that is unresolved in the world and ourselves. Uh, and it was a great, it was a great partnership for me. What's not being told about this movie is how much authorship this man had over the film. And I'm, I, I, I love this film. I don't say that about every film, especially mine. For our students, I would like to ask you a couple of questions that, with luck, they may have to answer someday. Some actors, like Nicholson, allow themselves great freedom from one take to the next. Yes. Never repeating what they've done before. Others are consistent from take to take. Do you have a preference? I, I prefer the first. I prefer to try to keep switching it up and seeing where it goes yeah. and where it lands. You'll surprise yourself in a delightful ways. How much of this role did you prepare before you arrived on the set? A lot. I studied this one, you know, for a few years, working it and developing it. And it, it, I can't tell you the value of that. That's why I'm saying you cannot research enough. It's, um, it's something that's going to come out of it. How much of Brad Pitt winds up in any role that you play? It has to be personal, so I'm in, I'm, there's a bit of me in, in all of it. I, it doesn't work otherwise. Good actors have a way of making us care about their characters. Because Moneyball is a beautifully made and beautifully acted film. We in the audience find ourselves rooting for Billy and this entire team of cast-offs and misfits as they struggle to pull off Billy's miracle. Here's what happens when they come close to it. You may have noticed an actor in these scenes, so did the Academy, for the Best Supporting Actor nomination. In this case, the support is prodigious. Brad, would you introduce your colleague to our students? I would be happy to. Mr. Jonah Hill.
The sabermetric system that drives Billy Bean and the movie seems impenetrable to me. You seem to have mastered it, did you? I tried my best. Um, I, I'm not currently working for a Major League Baseball team at this moment. No. Uh, um, thank heaven. We need you where you are. Thank but you. <laughs> many of the key moments in the film are two-handers, you and Brad. Tell us about working with Brad. It's great. Uh, I mean, he's sitting that. right there. No, uh, <laughs> obviously, I knew who he was and respected his work. And then once I got to work with him, especially in the capacity that our characters couldn't really function without the other one. What is the Jonah Hill experience, Brett? <laughs> well, um, you're usually on bottom. Uh, uh, usually. Uh, it's messy. It's messy, but it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Really good. Generally underwater. <laughs> Generally underwater. I can't. I can't say enough about Jonah as well. I mean, he acts like we did him a favor. He's, he's Jonah Hill for Christ's sake. My stuff doesn't work without Jonah, and and maybe that's true. The you know the other way. Certainly the way the characters were built. That they 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 completed each other. God. <laughs> See what that movie did to us. Um, are you yeah. saying, are you saying I complete you? I'm saying you complete me, Jonah. Thank you, thank you. I've been waiting a long time for that. <laughs> Finally. At this year's Golden Globes, when you and George Clooney were competing with each other head to head, film to film, he introduced your film and you introduced his. A show of mutual respect that is not normally associated with Hollywood. Was that the foreign press's suggestion or did the two of you propose it? No, that was us. I mean, so much is being made out of a competition and I don't even think it exists, really. I have so much respect for this guy. I mean, no one in my generation certainly has given more in front or behind the camera. As you go through these award ceremonies, is it possible that the two of you will wind up voting for each other? I would rather just recuse myself from voting altogether. Begin our classroom session always with the questionnaire that was asked for 26 years in France by Bernard Pivot, who does what I'm doing right now better than I can do it or anybody else can do it. Brad, what is your favorite word? Um, Daddy. What is your least favorite word? I pooped. <laughs> what turns you on? Exploration, discovery. What turns you off? When someone unequivocally tells me it can't be done. What sound or noise do you love? My baby sleeping at night, the breathing. It's... <laughs> when you're a parent, you will understand. What sound or noise do you hate? I have this friend for 20, of 23 years and we probably talk almost every day on the phone, and she does this. <laughs> and it drives me mental. You don't like that sound? I don't like it. I love her. What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's underused. It has great power, and I think we can do for it what the Brits did for so. <laughs> think about it. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Architecture. What profession would you absolutely not like to do? Right now, a politician running for an office. <laughs> Finally. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? I'm thinking about redoing the place. Got any ideas? <laughs> Here are your students. Hi, Brad. How are you? Good. My name's Taylor Place. I'm a second-year actor. I'm a huge fan of Fight Club. It's changed my life in ways that 
I don't even like recognize on a daily basis. You've spoken about how you put some of yourself in each of your characters to make them your own. How much do they affect you? Um, well, I listen, I, during Tree of Life, my dear friends told me I was an absolute ass to, to, to talk to. I didn't think I was. Sure, it affects you. I like the facets that each character adds and makes you think about and makes you think about it in, in your own life. And, um, the Fight Club, I, I covered my trailer in porn. <laughs> I mean, covered. I mean, covered. And like one Bruce Lee photo. And then one day they said, Susan Sarandon wanted to come by, to come say hi. I said, yeah, great. She came to the trailer and she was with her, I said, come in. She was with her daughter. And, and little Natalie Portman. Anyway, be careful. Hi, Brad. Um, my name's Charles Bryce. I'm a third-year actor. My question is, what is your process, and has it changed from the beginning of your career as opposed to where you are now? And yeah, if you just expand on that. <laughs> well, process takes many forms. I can't stress enough. Give yourself a break. And, and try anything and everything that feels right to help you get to this or help you access that. And if it doesn't work, discard it. If you get somewhere from it, then, then keep exploring it. But it gets honed down, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. I think what we need to be doing is just trying to find truthful moments first. And character will come. Character, there's just, I, I just felt like there's too much pressure on this idea of character. It will come, and you will be surprised how it comes, and it will keep coming, and it's an endless well, and you don't have to worry about it. You trust yourself. Don't pre-plan the scene, because you will, you will, you'll stink it up. <laughs> you don't have to squeeze everything in in every scene. It's going to, you're going to do, you're going to do one scene, and it's going to, you're going to get some of what you, you wanted in. You get three moments of truth, man, you won. And the next, it's going to inform the next scene, or the next, Thing you do or the next take but but I, what I find more beneficial is before each take is the direction put myself in a situation uh, like I want to kill this person I want to jump this person we're talking about intentions what we need at what we want at that moment just give yourself something different each take and see what see what happens all right, thank you so much. I, listen, I'm, thank you guys for sticking around. And this is interesting to me, really. It makes me... Mm.